Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Today, we're talking about Hawkeye, the six-episode Marvel TV series currently available on Disney+. Plus. At Rotten Tomatoes, the tomato meter score is 92%, and the critics' consensus reads, Hawkeye starts slowly, but the street-level action is a refreshing change of pace for the MCU, and the chemistry between its leads sparkles even when the plot lags. We're going to dive deep into that street level action because my guests today are from the second unit team, which is responsible for a good chunk of the stunt work on a series like this. First, Tim Fitzgerald, you were the second unit first AD for all six episodes of Hawkeye. I actually know you from my AD days back in LA when you were starting out as a PA. We worked on a couple of projects together. Great to have you on the show. Thanks, kid. It's great to be here. Also joining us is Darren Moran, Hawkeye's second unit director of photography. Darren, I've known you even longer than Tim since we met in Lithuania working on 2001's Attila for USA Network. I was the DGA trainee and you were the first assistant camera. Welcome to Below the Line. Thank you, Skid. I'm really excited to catch up with both of you today. Listeners, this is your spoiler warning for Hawkeye. That's the show we're focused on, but I think it's also worth noting out the gate that you two have been doing a lot of work together on Second Unit for Marvel. Talk to me a little bit about how you got to where you are in the Marvel world today. Tim, why don't you start? My first introduction to Marvel was Falcon and the Winter Soldier. The first assistant director on the show, Doug Plass, brought me on as the first AD for Second Unit because the director that was initially slated to do Second Unit, he had a really good relationship with. But before it actually all went down, that director fell out for whatever reason. I don't remember, maybe another opportunity. So uh, Paul Jennings came in, but Doug didn't know him. So I actually had to interview with Paul Jennings. So I met up with him at uh, his hotel in Midtown Atlanta, um, well, at a restaurant right below it. And we hit it off real quick and he basically hired me on the spot. And so I've just been kind of riding the Paul Jennings train through the Marvel Universe since then. And that was uh, end of 2019 um, when that all began. Darren, how's it work on the director of photography side of the house? On Falcon and the Winter Soldier, my good friend Patrick Loungeway, who I had worked as a camera operator before many times in the past, he's a second unit director of photography, needed to leave. He had a directing opportunity. Uh, on a big feature for a a second unit and was exiting. Um, And he gave my name. I had previously to Falcon Winter Soldier spent about six and a half years shooting indie movies and uh, not operating as a camera operator, just being a DP, focusing on small films. And uh, Patrick and I had maintained a relationship, a friendship, and he knew that I was, you know, looking for work and put my name in the hat. Fortunately for me, the supervisor, the production supervisor on second unit was also a friend and noticed when my name came through Patrick, uh, somebody that he trusted, that we knew each other from other shows. And I subsequently got an opportunity to interview with Paul also. And uh, we hit it off pretty easily and went through the Falcon and the Winter Soldier was a very technical, difficult and sort of unpredictable show. It was the first streaming show that Marvel had done. So it was a hybrid of feature people and episodic kind of schedule. So it was like trial by fire for us. And we, all three of us, and including some more people, uh, Carl, the supervisor and Cody, Tim's second AD, became really close through that experience. So you both interviewed with Paul Jennings. Paul Jennings has a rich history of stunt work and then directing second units as many stunt folks move in that direction. But clearly he didn't come in with his own team. Talk to me about him working with him and and how you guys bonded. For me, uh, it was kind of an interesting thing because again, like as you mentioned, we hadn't worked together before, um, but we got along. So I, I felt very comfortable around him. I felt like I could basically be myself. You know, I never had to, put on a show or anything. It was just like, I can just be me, do things the way I do them. And he accepted it. I think it kind of fit in very well. You know, the beginning, as uh, Darren mentioned, originally our director of photography was Patrick Loungeway. So, you know, just kind of the first initial meetings going through the pre and this is on Falcon and the Winter Soldier, just getting everybody in a room and basically doing all the R&D and, and realizing like when you're watching a pre you're like, okay, so they're, and they're like, nobody has figured anything out yet. And we're like, wow, that's, <laughs> we're shooting this in like a week. They're like they just brought us in, like, didn't anybody start figuring this out yet? And it kind of, we kind of had to start kind of really piecing it together. And Paul, I think really 
kind of enjoyed that workflow, getting involved, asking the questions, breaking down every little bit and scene about how we're going to do this, how we're going to do that. I think that kind of brought it together. And then obviously when Darren came along, for me, it just kind of, we just kind of rolled right in it together. You know, Darren joined in flawlessly and, and seamlessly uh, on that process of going through pre and that was some of the funnest times sitting in that meeting room. Uh, we had a, another guy with us, uh, or, you know, obviously in the Marvel uh, universe, visual effects is like supreme. I mean, that's like, you know, so we always have a visual effects supervisor assigned to our unit. And at the time it was this, this guy, uh, Dan Mellitz, who we all had a lot of fun with. And it was uh, those meeting rooms became kind of a mix between having fun bantering with each other, you know, about how we're going to do things, but also getting the work done. And, and it was quite enjoyable. Working with Paul Jennings and working with somebody that sets the tone, the tone that he sets is he allows you to do your job. He nudges you in the directions he wants you to go, but there's a bandwidth for creativity from everybody. Yeah. He's a director in the truest sense. He has an idea what he wants to accomplish, but he allows his creative team and his AD team to expand on the ideas and what works for him stays in and what doesn't gets discarded or is revisited later if there's something that that needs to be revisited. The workflow that Tim set up with Paul was extremely helpful. The amount of information that you get about a sequence, for instance, a fight sequence, it could be a massive amount of information where it's, it feels overwhelming. There's location information. There's story points that have to fit into the fight. There are histories of the characters that are interacting that have to be considered all servicing the brand. Tim and Paul created a great sort of analytic approach to breaking the material down. It was really enjoyable because it took a lot of the anxiety and stress out of this big chunk of material breaking it down in its component parts. They were little meals that we could manage, easy to digest, and we can marinate in a whole sequence uh, because we, we weren't stressed out about the magnitude of, of some of the work. Well, let's spend a little bit more time talking about what second units are trying to get done. In general, I, I've done a couple of second units in my time when I was in LA. And when I worked on TV, oftentimes we would stand up a second unit to pick up scenes that we couldn't get to as a main unit or that the actors weren't going to be in any way. But I don't think I've ever had the experience of being engaged with a second unit that is basically, from what you guys are describing, on full time. And I can imagine how the stunt heavy, visual effects heavy shows that you're doing for Marvel would demand that. But give us a better sense of how the second unit comes together, what you're trying to accomplish, and how you interact with first unit and the rest of production. Well, for me, I've never really done second units as a first AD before until the Marvel thing. I was mainly just a main unit AD on shows that didn't even have a second unit. So for me, it was kind of new, but luckily, I guess, so at least so I can only speak from the Marvel perspective as far as my own experience. But usually you have the first AD or the, the main first AD on the main unit will basically break down the entire schedule from beginning to end and then determine what pieces need to be siphoned off to second unit. Again, yes, most of the time they're ones that are just, you know, uh, stunt heavy and uh, things like that. But I found that there's always the knowledge that there's going to be a whole lot more coming to us other than what's figured out from the beginning. They don't know what it is yet. So I think that we're there is just kind of a almost like a backup unit also. I always find that, and I think Darren will agree, and we've had this kind of conversation before about second unit is always not the best term for what we do. I know Paul likes to call it action unit, which kind of makes more sense as a second unit, but we're also the slop unit. We're also another first unit at times. I think each show is a little bit different. The ones that we've done, uh, not all Marvel shows have a full-time second unit. I know one of the ones that's coming out, I can't really say too much about it, had a very spotty second unit. I've even done some of it like for a few days here and there. Actually, Darren was with me on it, but it wasn't full-time. But the ones that we've done full-time have been pretty much, we were there because they just knew that something would come up and they needed another team to kind of step in at a moment's notice and pick up the pieces. Now, Darren, in talking about the work of Second Unit, give me an idea from the cinematography perspective. Is it fair to say that 
the look of the show is being established by a DP or I don't know, Mar does Marvel use multiple DPs on first unit with these shows? As photography is concerned, fitting into the look, there's usually with a with a two DP main unit, there's one DP that that comes on and has the lion's share of the episodes. Um, and that person is usually in early and developing the look with the show with the director who's also doing the lion's share. That would be Reese and Eric Spielberg on Hawkeye. So they were sort of setting the tone. This is the most challenging part about being a DP on second unit. And like Tim, I hadn't done a lot of second units only as an operator in years ago, but never as a DP. I was shooting my own films up until the, uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier. It's very challenging because my style of storytelling is irrelevant. What I shoot has to fit into the whole and it has to be a part of the show and maintain that consistency. And I enjoy the challenge of it, actually. And it's a, it's a technical challenge and less a creative challenge. I do enjoy that part of it. It's a component of cinematography that I, I hadn't exercised that muscle before. So it is enjoyable. And when the relationships with the main unit DPs are enjoyable and collaborative, it's great. Tim, you mentioned earlier also that visual effects plays a large role. Do you guys have your own visual effects team separate from what's on first unit? Or are those folks going back and forth as far as the integrating that effort? Uh, a little bit of both. We always have one specific person assigned to us, you know, a second unit supervisor. But as, no, I mean, if I've dealt with VFX and other shows before, but this is at a whole nother level. I mean, a VFX supervisor on a show is essentially a producer. And depending on the show, some of them can be almost as important as the director. You know, it was actually a little bit of a learning curve for me at, in the beginning to say, like, you know, who is this guy? Why are they always like, why do they why do they need all this stuff? And then as I learn and go on and on, I'm like, oh, wow, OK, I get it now. But to get more specific to your question, for the most part, there is a person or two that's assigned strictly to second unit. But then there's this other mesh of people that come in and out, uh, depending on the sequence and stuff like that. So there is the back and forth also, but yeah, there is an, an assigned individual to us uh, that's our person. You both said that uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier was your first experience in the, your current positions with second unit. Give me an idea of other challenges that maybe you hadn't expected or things you learned, experiences that you've carried into these other shows. I think there's something I'm sort of itching to talk about, and that's uh, in regards to that. At first, I was very, I felt very kind of frustrated and stifled by the pre -viz workflow where we'd get this thing that was approved it had to be broken down and it just seemed so mechanical and you know, I didn't really know where my creative thoughts were going to be welcome how they were going to be received if they were going to be used or not and so there was a, a little bit of trepidation when I first started uh, working in the Marvel universe and then I discovered surprisingly that there's a there's a large creative bandwidth within second unit and within any creative aspect of the Marvel filmmaking universe, you just have to find the stream of creative bandwidth that is offered to you. It's not laid out on a piece of paper. You kind of have to find it. And I usually go through the production designer and the visual effects supervisor and Paul and kind of like navigate, okay, well, what's my creative bandwidth on this job? And then you find it, you work within it, and it's very satisfying. So that's something that it took me a little bit of time to discover. And now on each job, I kind of search for where that is and who the collaborators are and kind of try to fit myself in there in a place that's respectful and contributing to the show. Maybe we should discuss a little bit about the process of the pre and all that. I don't know how familiar your audience would be about even what we're talking about when we mentioned pre or all that. But essentially, you know, when the creativity begins way before we ever come on, you know, there's a storyboard artist that comes on and puts together storyboards with the upper Marvel creative from the very top. It goes through a, a very rigorous process of approval. And then it comes down to another level of where they do an animation, like a previs, what we call an animated version of what they want shot. And it's very important. And even when I first came on to Marvel, you know, Doug Plass, who was the first AD on Falcon Winter Soldier, told me, you know, from the very beginning, you shoot the previs. That's what you do. If you have any other time after that, you guys can shoot whatever you want. But the main thing is you got to deliver the previs. So, you know, that previs, especially on the second unit, then takes another form because that previs is then given to Paul and the stunt coordinator and the fight choreographer 
And they will then perform that previs in a rehearsal space using props. I mean, you name it. I mean, it's almost as good as uh, the actual <laughs> show sometimes. And they even add animation into it. They read the lines. It's actually very entertaining to watch. And then that gets approved because it goes from the previs to then Paul and the stunt coordinator and the fight choreographer, then kind of maybe even making changes to the previs. It then has to be approved on top of that. And then that becomes our Bible. So once that is put together, then they'll take that choreography from the stunt department and then intermesh it with the actual animated previs. So it'll go from animation to real uh, rehearsal space and then back, you know, it's all cut together. And that becomes our final product. And then as Darren uh, very aptly coined the term, uh, whatever other time we get, we shoot what he calls previs plus, you know, any other great ideas that people come up with, you know, or Paul wants to do that maybe that, you know, but essentially, you know, you have to deliver the previs and then anything else you get uh, is bonus. The great thing about previs plus is it's an incentive to get the previs done. If creative people, when they start working on, on these shows, like I find like you satisfy the brand maintenance that comes from the top. That's a fun exercise already. And then you have ideas on top of that. It keeps the energy level high. People want to get to previs plus because they want to see if their idea works. They want to see if it if it makes it into the show or if it's it's well received by the stunt players or Paul or you know whatever. It creates an environment of creativity, and it's all kind of curated by Tim and Paul of like what do we have time for versus how important are these previs sequences? How literally do we have to stick to them? And that's a malleable and subjective thing based on the executive in charge of the show, uh, the VFX supervisor's input. Like it's all kind of a, a wild sort of shifting dynamic. So coming forward to Hawkeye, did you guys know that you'd be rolling onto Hawkeye off of Falcon or was there a break in between? How did that work? No, we kind of knew actually. And we were, so Falcon, this winter soldier happened right in the middle of COVID. Like we were shooting in Prague, COVID hit. Uh, this is back in March of 2020, and we got sent home. Like toward the end, we weren't finished with the show. Five months later, we came back. We finished up a little bit here in Atlanta, then went back to Prague. And I remember when we were in Prague at that point, because Doug, the first AD from Falcon and the Winter Soldier, was also doing Hawkeye, um, started talking to Paul about Hawkeye. So at that point, we knew that that was coming up. I mean, there might have been a break in between, but not as far. We knew on the plane ride home at the end of Falcon and the Winter Soldier that Hawkeye was coming up next. So with all of this planning, does that mean that second unit also gets a bunch of pre-production? Like, are you guys coming on early to start working these issues even before filming starts? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Not as much as first unit, of course. But for the most part, we've been on, you know, weeks, if not a month or so. I don't remember exactly, but... I've never felt we've had a lack of prep. And I mean, even on Hawkeye, we were doing meetings for our next show while we were still on Hawkeye. Zoom and all that stuff uh, on weekends or, you know, on days off. You know, not, not nothing bad, but just, you know, an hour here or there. So, yeah, I, f I feel like we've been on early enough. <laughs> we'll try to tease some information about your next show out of you guys at the end. But on Hawkeye, <laughs> I read that they started filming in New York in December of 2020 before moving to Atlanta. Were you guys also up in New York City? We joined once we got back to Atlanta, but Paul Jennings was in New York City uh, shooting a lot of the plate stuff that they use back here and some other like helicopter work, a lot of all that stuff I, I believe he was doing. But he was in New York with them, but myself or Darren were not. Give me an idea then about how things came together, what it looked like starting out in Atlanta. For me, it was kind of like, you know, again, it was just like the normal process. At least we had a little bit more experience with it this time, but once I came to Atlanta, we were given all the previs. Uh, we knew well ahead of time the sequences that we were principally in charge of doing, the stuff that they knew from the beginning that we were going to end up being in charge of, of completing. So again, we just, you know, we got into the offices. Darren and I had a cool little office set up where we had a window between our offices so he could <laughs> pretend like he was going to throw a chair at me through the window and I could bang on his thing while he was uh, interviewing with camera operators and stuff, you know, so that, that was fun. <laughs> Uh, totally. That's the best thing about it. the only fun part about pre-production is the fun we have. That's the good thing. 
But yeah, it was pretty much typical. We, you know, again, got in there, broke all the uh, previs down that we were in charge of. I think the first thing that landed on our plate was the big car chase. That was kind of yeah. a major like hurdle to accomplish. And, and that was extremely challenging because for one, we were shooting that in downtown Atlanta for New York. So that was a challenge. Also locations issues as far as you know, securing locations, you know, being able to shoot in the daytime and during rush hour in the heart of downtown Atlanta and working out what days we can shoot and the hours we can shoot, how much work we had there. So I remember a lot of the process that we started with, especially did a lot of scouting, just getting out there uh, myself, Darren, Paul, visual effects and locations and just going out and just driving around, seeing places, oh, will this work for this? I always carry my tablet with me. I have the previs so we can actually in real time go through the previs and break down. Okay, is this a good place to shoot this shot and this shot and this shot? We got to break it all down and then go back to the office and we talk about it and say, okay, well, we can shoot this chunk here and then we can move here. As you know, just the whole logistical stuff of moving around. I and mean, we shot that in, I don't know, three different places downtown. Obviously, it also included exploding a van in the middle of the street. So there was a lot of work. That was basically what we kind of ran right into uh, when, once we hit the ground in Atlanta. So Tim, you're referencing that car chase in episode three where Clint and Kate escape from Echo and the tracksuit mafia gang, steal the car. And then yes, there's a Christmas tree lot. They go out on a bridge. And this is the first thing that you guys started with as far as the show is concerned. Correct. I, but that was broken up though. Like we didn't shoot it all at once because there were location. Like I think we went there and then we went away for a while. We shot some of like the bridge sequence we shot at the Atlanta Motor Speedway against blue screens. I was pretty blown away when I saw the show. I was like, wow, they really pulled that off. I was a little questioning it at first. I was like, is this really going to look like a bridge? But so the bridge was a set built at the speedway because the blue screens around. That's I wouldn't have guessed yeah. either. Yeah, they laid in some K rail on either side, so they gave some limits. You got a you know some foreground stuff, but the rest was uh, the two long blue screens running on either side of the. Uh... No, were they on both sides there or one? Now I can't remember. They were on both sides, but yeah. we we sort of because of the sun path, we shot mostly uh, one direction to the other. Yeah, that's right. We did reverse the action a couple of times and, you know, where, where we were able to cheat it. And that was one of the bigger issues, despite, I mean, Jimmy Whitaker, main unit DP for that episode was James Whitaker. He developed a remote head and grip tracking rig for the interior portions of the car with the actors. And Paul Jennings worked really closely with Bert and Bertie, the main unit directors of that episode, and uh, Heidi Moneymaker, the stunt coordinator, and Noon Orsati, the assistant stunt coordinator. They worked together to build choreography of the vehicles to mesh with the performances of the actors. And this was an extremely complex one -er, in quotations in the sense that it needed to feel like one shot. So all that choreography when you watch the sequence with the driving was all timed out and shot before the actor's portion was shot. Because of that previs and because you've been involved with the director and the first unit DP, all of you have coordinated that allows you to basically build the skeleton and then they can just put the meat on it where we want the actors to show up. That was a, a major, you know, that was a, a lot of choreography. A lot of art department work was involved in that as well. We, because we were shooting on several different streets in, in Atlanta, um, and it had to look like a downtown area of, of New York or Brooklyn, actually, I believe it was. When we scouted, Tim and I and Paul would scout, I would take a bunch of pictures, GPS tagged, and say, we're going to look this way on the street and we're going to look over here. I made a Google spreadsheet for the art department that had those images so they could go back with location information and they could put signage up and detail the streets in the, those areas to kind of bring it into the, the language of New York rather than rely on visual effects for all that stuff, because the bill would be massive it had to be yeah. done all in visual effects. We were also chasing the season too. Now, as more time went on, we're getting into March, April, and now it's like, okay, the leaves are coming on the trees, supposed to be Christmas time. You know, it's just like a lot of, you know, a lot of challenges in that. That was a challenging first sequence going into it and trying to digest all the mechanics of making it and then breaking it into its little pieces so it's manageable. That's why I always tribute Tim to like, my job is so much easier because his analytics are so solid and he knows the story and he knows the script and where everything goes. 
So if ever there's any question about where this goes, where that goes, he's approachable and he nine times out of 10 has the answer. You guys are like a honeymoon couple. I mean, we'll tell like <laughs> seven or eight shows and then we'll see. <laughs> well, you should see us on set sometimes. It's not always. We argue. We argue. We like, are like we argue husband constantly. and wife. Yeah, we're always <laughs> butting heads. <laughs> and it's We're like a running joke on set. You know? like, <laughs> totally. And then, and then Paul Jennings gets involved and then it's a whole and it's a three way you know, <laughs> yeah, really great. Or you'll come in as a mediator and be like, I just want everyone to be happy. And can you guys just stop, you know, and we'll just be, yeah. So the appearance of like a, it's super chummy, chummy. Uh, we are friends. Absolutely. <laughs> but we can, we've gone to places I've never gone with a first AD before, but you know, I actually just have to say like, that's always the most tentative relationship as a DP is who the first is and how we work together. And I can't say that I mesh with people all the time. And originally on Falcon, Tim and I were re- had a really hard time working together. Then we found our place. I think it's just about being open to changing your, your workflow or your approach to certain things. And everyone, wants, especially DPs, want to carve out a niche for themselves that's, you know, whether it's lighting or camera movement and you're you're always kind of pushing against the sun or time or whatever. And Tim is kind of the arbiter of those things. But once we got to know each other, we we really have a mutual respect for each other's work. And I think that really helps. You know, we're good friends, too. I mean, we're, we hang out outside of work. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he's, he's, we've, we've made ribeyes together in my backyard over beer and wine. And I'll tell oh. you, he makes probably the best homemade salad dressing he I ever had. <laughs> he just picked through my refrigerator and found just random tidbits and made some incredible <laughs> from scratch salad dressing it's going to blow your mind <laughs> well guys i'm glad you came here as friends because it would have been awkward for me to have to mediate between yeah. you so i appreciate yeah. that as well i want to ask you guys some questions about a little bit of detail in that car chase talk to me about the portion where you go through the christmas tree lot pulling trees onto the cars you run over that sand at the end that actually that christmas tree lot was probably overall in the sequence one of the most difficult portions because again there's always this kind of tug of war between the effects and just on set practical uh stuff is how much are they going to have to take over how what are we going to do and of course in the beginning they want us to do everything we try to get as much as we can but in the end whatever we can't get falls to vfx i mean at some point there was this whole talk about an actual special effects rig on the front of the truck that was actually going to pull trees off the side and actually pull into the truck uh the front of the truck and at first i'm like oh my god really like this, <laughs> we're gonna have to add that time into the day like how that doesn't go right how you know and ultimately when it came down to it that ended up being a visual effects which i thought ended up looking amazing by the way i i was a little bit skeptical I was I was almost afraid they were just going to scrap that part altogether. Trees coming onto the hood of the car, but it actually worked out great. But again, that that was all the effects. But there was a time where that was going to be practical, uh, you know, special effects, you know, which is basically the actual practical effects. They were at some stage prepping to do something for that. Uh, we didn't end up doing it, but. We did have actual a real Santa Claus, uh, a little <laughs> with a fan on it and everything. <laughs> Greg Steele was the visual effects supervisor for the show and is it such a nice guy and a, such a talented VFX supervisor. He was really good about giving us information of what he needs. Just collect me some images of that thing flapping and I'll, you know, I'll make another one and make it fit under the car and all that stuff. So I believe we did it with and without, right? Yeah, I don't think we ever actually ran it over because I think the clear, we couldn't remember the effects had to put, is like a little fan that blows up through oh, the right. Santa to make it wiggle. We couldn't drive over we the fan. We couldn't get over it. There was no clearance. It's one of those things that sometimes you get there, you're like, oh shit, we didn't think that there was a fan, you know, so we can't really do that. We were planning on it, but when we actually got there and saw like, oh wait, there's an actual object that's, you know, that car is pretty low. Also, that was a reverse driver. That car was going in reverse. Yeah, did correct? we have kazoo in that one? I can't remember. Yeah. I think we did. Reverse drive. It's like a pod car. You know, there's like the guy's like sitting in the trunk of the car, basically driving backwards with a little. With a remote driving setup, which is an electronic uh, system that for the gas and the, and the brakes and the steering, which runs yeah. the car from a uh, position anywhere on the car. They can put the pod wherever they like. They used a lot on Baby Driver and other movies, but 
this particular one, he was in the trunk. When his helmet was on, he looked like Kazoo from the from Flintstones. Flintstones. <laughs> you, know, you know, the little alien that floats around with the like, yeah. so we called him Kazoo because he had this little helmet on. Uh, he was, I forgot his name, is a guy from Australia. Uh, yeah, stunt, stunt driver, yeah. Yeah, one of the best. But yeah, that was, uh, that was quite fun. Well, I was impressed. I would have thought more of that was practical. Uh, those, uh, the visual effects work on that really does integrate seamlessly with the work that you guys did as well. I think on that, on that whole chase, it's a lot of fun. Visual effects did a great job with the Christmas trees. I also felt like, wow, I was blown away. Yeah. So talk to me about second unit's role on some of the hand-to-hand sequences. There's a bunch in the series. What are some of your favorites? I guess the first one we started with was the heist in the uh, the auction, you know, in the wine cellar. Main unit took their chunk out of that first and basically left us with the cleanup and all the stunt action and stuff. So that, that was very interesting. That was a, a fun sequence to shoot. Renee Moneymaker, Heidi's sister, was the stunt double for Haley, the lead actress. And that was... Uh, very interesting to watch her perform that because yeah, it was very the actual set was quite small don't think it kind of played that way on in the final product but physically that space was not very big and it was very cluttered and it was like post destruction so there's stuff everywhere we really had to like you know we were in a confined space in that regard but again i mean the work that heidi and lloyd who was the fight choreographer for that the work that they put in along with renee and all the other uh stunt performers on that sequence was just really f- an amazing process to watch later we'll get into more detail because i want to save it for the uh the rooftop fight but just watching them work in their stunt space in their rehearsal space is re- quite fascinating in the, in the hours and the work they put in i mean they're rehearsing all day and then they have to go shoot at night. You know, those kind of things. It just, I don't know how they do it, but they're the best in the biz. I have to agree with coming from a DP's perspective, working with somebody like Heidi Moneymaker and Renee Moneymaker and Lloyd, I can't remember his last name, but talented, talented choreographers. Also talented in visual and storytelling in the storytelling sense, like some of Heidi's designs, they're funny they're engaging, they're fast moving. They tell the story really well, really quickly. Her attention to detail and servicing the, the bigger picture of the story and Haley's character is awesome, including the comedy that's sort of a, a part of the show. Uh, so watching their rehearsals and then going and making the actual sequences on the stage were it's a, a joy to work with somebody with that much enthusiasm and that much talent where it's actually, as a DP, made my job really easy. I just lit to match Eric's work. And we have a great camera operator that we've been using, John Garrett, who's a talented dude and kind of gets it, gets fight choreography, wants to be included in pre-production a little bit so he can learn the moves, so he can be faster and and more reactive on on the day. With all those things, like it's an absolute joy when you get to work with people like that. You know, Darren, as an aside, you mentioned this show does have a lighter tone, if you will. There's still heavy action sequences, but there is a lot of comedic elements. And you mentioned how that would affect the stunt choreography. Does it affect the cinematography as well? In other words, do you make decisions with that lighter air in mind? I would say not lighting decisions because the show is is lit in a dramatic way. It had a very contrasty feel. It's still very dark. It had, you know, we're shooting with anamorphic lenses and it was meant to look like a film, like a big film, not a high key comedy, but the camera work, absolutely. The tempo of the camera work, trying to use the camera in a way that it feels seamless. So it doesn't feel like a bunch of cuts, designing those pieces, uh, working with the stunt choreographer and Heidi and John Garrett to kind of make those things feel like a oneers. That's what Heidi wanted to do. She wanted to string together these shots so the action never felt like it was too cutty. It felt like it was fluid. I feel like she was very successful in doing that. It was definitely a collaboration to make those things happen. What's possible, what's not possible. Lighting for those sequences so we could get it all in one uh, when possible. Tim, you mentioned earlier the rooftop. We're talking about that sequence in episode four that turns into a four-way fight between Clint, Kate, Echo and the mysterious assassin who, spoiler warning, turns out to be Elena from the Black Widow movie. Tell me about how that sequence came together for Second Unit. 
that one uh, was on our plate from the very beginning. That was one of the ones we knew coming down the road that was coming. I can't remember exactly the pre I don't think there was too there was a lot of storyboards for that one, but that one really came together in Heidi's and Paul's mind in a meeting we um one of the things I really love about Paul is he loves the shot list. That's mm-hmm. I love shot listing. It's it's I think the best thing to do. Um Paul, like, you know, even something, even if we haven't done it, he'll call me like before the set, like a couple hours before a call, be like, all right, Tim, let's get this shot. And we'll sit on the, you know, he'll dictate it to me and I'll type it up or whatever we put it together. But this one, we really um, came together in Heidi's choreography space at the studio. She has a, a large, like an entire soundstage just built for, you know, stunts. Um, you know, they have weights in there, they have a space to, shoot choreography to practice. I mean, they got like punching bags and dummies and nunchucks and like swords and every prop guns, everything you can imagine. One of the cool things, I don't know if I'm giving away trade secrets here, but it seems like every stunt department does this. They have cardboard boxes and they build out the spaces. They, yeah. you know, they, they get the dimensions uh, from the art department and they build out the spaces. So they have a uh, real space to work in. And then if they fall into it, it doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah, exactly. So basically that one really came together there. I remember, I mean, Darren was there. We, Johnny G, John Garrett, our operator, obviously Paul, Heidi, um, Renee, uh, Lloyd, you know, and, and others. And then, and then obviously the stunt performers. And we would literally just go shot by shot, spend hours in there walking it through. Uh, Paul's very good at making visual, like we'll print out a large piece of paper and he'll go through every shot and write it down on a piece of paper in each direction, every shot as a number, what direction we're shooting, then I'll type up a list that matches that visual. We'll just spend hours or, you know, maybe even a couple days in that space and just work it out beat by beat. And then they'll shoot a stunt viz and put it together and that'll all go through the approval. And that's one that really came where we kind of worked it out from the ground up there. It obviously all goes through approval processes and we'll come back and fix things or change things. But that one was just a lot of hard work. And I remember just seeing Renee, you know, seeing just the toll it took on her, just all the hours and and the physicality of it all. Absolutely. The other hard part about that is we were shooting that, that was all night work. So then when we got to the set, we began to shoot. It was freezing cold. It was all night, a lot of difficult choreography, a lot of, you know, we had some wire work, that was a set a rooftop set we built um in a big space uh here just north of atlanta called ofs it's an old fiber optics thing and they have an enormous space in the back and they built these like got the i don't know how how tall are they like 70 foot 70 foot tall it's a it's a giant it's i believe that's what we believe it's like uh the width of it is massive oh yeah they're basically stacked. It's containers. a couple of football fields and, yeah. uh, of blue screen and at 70 feet of backlight facing. And we had several sets in there. I mean, we had yeah. the rooftop set. We had two rooftop sets of the, the ice rink plus the FAO, FAO Schwartz. Schwartz was there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Ma- it's massive. It's massive. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to go back to what you were talking about, the rehearsal in Heidi's space. It really was a great creative place for Paul, especially to work. I think is like the has become like the default for us in a fight sequence as a team because Paul really gets to interact with the stunt coordinator and the fight choreographer, the the stunt people uh, or an actor or two if necessary. That the stunt department's always training them for their pieces, so Paul really gets to shape that in that environment. And once he's comfortable, like he'll bring me in to, to work with Lloyd because Lloyd's shooting the stunt viz or whatever, whoever the fight coordinator is to, to kind of start working on camera angles that he's interested in or that creativity that I have. We can kind of mesh that into it early. Working with a camera operator as well, John Garrett. It's like rehearsing a little play, rehearsing a dance number, and then you go out and you do it and do it for real. But everybody knows each other. Then we have a shorthand. You're not coming to work and being like, you know, who's this person? Who's that person? Like, you know, these people, you spend hours with them uh, rehearsing or at least observing their rehearsals. And I have to say like the, the quality of the people that sort of exist in, in my experience in the Marvel universe are positive, creative, talented, and happy people, happy to be there, happy to be doing the work. 
for me, when I think about Hawkeye, that moment being in that room and watching them work and, you know, I always think as an AD, I'm, I'm supposed to make sense of all the creativity that's going on, like allow the people to be as creative as they want. And then I have to then take that and put it on to some kind of roadmap that we can accomplish and watching people work like that and being able to figure it out and, and make their uh, creative desires actually come to fruition. And then that, and that includes Darren, you know, as far as like, <laughs> no, I mean, but allowing, you know, all that, you know, as far as on the creative side of it, coming up with ideas, working, you know, obviously knowing the camera angles, how things work, you know, a lot of times even stunt people, and even Paul don't think about a lot of things. And Darren will be like, oh, well, you know, this is a way better angle. What if we did it from here? Or, you know, you get a lot more bang for your buck here. You know, those kind of things. Just seeing all that happen in real time and all these creative ideas bouncing off each other. Then where I come in is, you know, being able to sit down and then put that together into some kind of roadmap that we can accomplish in the time given. And then when it works, there's nothing more gratifying. Tim gets frustrated with me because sometimes I do change my mind. Like I'll sleep on it. I'll come in the next day and be like, you said you were going to shoot that way first. And like, oh, yeah, but like, over here, it's like a little bit better this morning. And yeah, yeah, I'm but, with Tim um, on that. I'm with that's, Tim on that one. Darren. No, that's Sorry. where we, that's where we get. I know. I know. That's, that's a classic. That's the classic divide. But Hey, but, but I always, I always, I always, I have to do my little, you know, whining. He has to have his thing. Yeah. No, but that's, and that's, again, that's why I think, Tim and I work well together because of what he just explained is he's there to roadmap the creativity. Yeah. Like when you look at it from that perspective, I think that's what I love about working with him the most is that, that aspect of his approach to the work. Yeah. Cause I do. It's I not really, just, uh, it's not. Go ahead. Go ahead. Say more good things about me. No, I just, I, <laughs> <laughs> how did I get myself in this position? Now the, um, it's an underlying understanding that that's the mission. The mission isn't just ones and zeros or, or this and that and a schedule. Some ADs don't have what Tim has. It was just the understanding of facilitating the storytelling and facilitating the creativity. For some people, it's just managing, you know, herding cats. Yeah, or just get the schedule. Like, you know, I mean, of right. course, that's my job, but I, I don't want to do that at the expense of people's creative ideas because at the end, I want to be proud of the work that I did. And no one's going to look at the show and be like, man, Tim, you really scheduled that show so well. No, they're going to look <laughs> at the show and be like, wow, the shit was, out of that. <laughs> yeah, man, we can, we can see that. It was written all over the screen, how you scheduled it. No, what they're going to see is is the creative, how good the show was. And if it's a, that's where I get my satisfaction. And if I, you know, I'm there to you know, help the create, like I said, is allow as much creativity as possible and then roadmap within the time it, allotted know. within, within yeah, the time, within allotted. time allotted but but again i want to get the shots and i want all parties i want paul to get everything he wants i want darren to get everything he wants i want you know the stunt performers to feel good that they got the shot you know they want their performances to be good too so like i want the stunt people to do the things they want to do i want id's you know her her vision to come onto the screen and just allowing people to if we have to go again or if we can have to try something different and just call an audible in the middle of the day. And even though it might take longer, but you know what? I know everybody knows at the end of the day, we have to make the day. If Darren needs some extra time on one thing, I know that he'll make a concession somewhere down the road in the day and it'll all work out fine. It's a horse trade when, when yeah, you, you exactly. know, if I pitch a big, uh, not a fit, but if I have a big, you know, if I'm very invested in like this particular sunset shot or whatever, then I'll make up the time in lighting something else. Or we'll stick Noon or Saudi in a wig and have him drive a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> we did that. We, did, yeah. we definitely did that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, gentlemen, let me jump ahead to episode six. And I'm very interested to hear about how these elements of rehearsal, also the effort involved with camera, Darren, how that came together for the scrolling tumble fight where we're going from office to office in the building while Yelena and Kate duke it out. The conception of that, I think we were Heidi and Paul Jennings working together, working out what bits happen in each room. And the desire was to make that one big right to left scrolling action. And then they would punctuate it with whatever 
main unit bits. They wanted to intersperse comedy in there and some dialogue. So they designed this incredible thing, which we shot uh, with wipes from each doorway. I think the max we did were two sections in a row, continuous, and then we'd have a wipe. That was a challenging set. It was a practical set that had been dressed by the art department for that. Uh, wasn't done on a stage. It was challenging to light, but it was it was uh, it was fun. It was a unique uh, way to shoot a stunt sequence in a two dimensional kind of video game style where things are happening directionally and is scrolling. You know, the camera's on a I think a eighty feet of dolly track. Yeah. To clarify for me, so Darren, you said you were at a practical set. It wasn't something you built on a stage. Well, it wasn't built on stage. I believe those offices were built. It was a, it's, it's a, the Grant building in downtown Atlanta. It's a very old, in fact, it's a really nice building, but it was up on, I forgot what floor. I think a lot of that building is empty. So I think the art department built that inside a, an actual building, not on a set. But there was a hallway out in front where they laid down, as Darren said, 80 feet of dolly track, and they could just scroll along looking right in through the windows of the offices. Yeah, so it wasn't practical in the sense that the offices were pre-existing. It was an office building which the art department adapted and built a set on top of existing space. They used some of the freestanding pillars and so on, but they yeah, they created a Christmas time office set that stretched for those 80 or just a little bit, maybe longer than 80 feet. That makes sense. But you didn't have as much control as you would on a stage. From a lighting perspective, it, w- it was difficult because we, we were limited. We didn't have green beds. We weren't able to rig too much infrastructure, grids and stuff to hang over the top. So we, we were very much at the mercy of practical lighting with some hidden uh, some hidden movie lights and, and using fixtures. And it was like work with the art department to put fixtures in place that helped us in that regard, that we can motivate light from and also, you know, that we can photograph. So there was a little combination of art department work in there and the fixtures department to build stuff out. This seems to be one, Darren, where what the camera's going to do, what the stunt folks rehearse, there's a lot of coordination there. Yeah, and actually the camera, the camera's a passive observer. It really is up to the dolly grip. It's kind of boring for John Garrett because really just was a no panning and tilting. Hmm. I mean, because once you get into that space and you're trying to replicate sort of a scrolling video game, you can't pan and tilt. It ruins the effect. So the dolly grip has to keep up with the action. And so it was really more about finding a lens that worked that showed enough information, but stayed within the set boundaries and and allowed us to capture both of them doing their thing in one frame. And is this one where you would film the second unit work first and then first unit would do the inserts to figure out where the little quips are going to take place? Or was that reversed? No, we shot that first. Yeah. And then they, they, they sort of wrote around the, and Heidi and Paul worked together to find natural beats for where a dialogue might take place. Heidi and Paul Jennings gave uh, the main unit opportunities by creating spots in the stunt sequence that would allow them to insert a dialogue piece between the two. And actually that was one um, Reese main unit director was with us he would come in in the morning because we shot not, not okay movie morning, which is probably at the time maybe six p.m. because <laughs> <laughs> that was we shot that at night. Um, Reese would come in early with us, or he would. I think they were main unit was shooting close by, um, so I think he would just come over meet us before call, and we'd walk through with him. And so he had some say in a lot of it before we went, since he has you know had the opportunity to come in and and uh, be with us during our pre-call and talk with Paul and walk through what we were planning on doing and have his input and all that. At the end of that scene, both of our actresses scale down the side of a building into Rockefeller Center by the ice skating rink. And at that point, we pick up with this massive sequence. This has uh, second unit's fingerprints all over it. Yeah, yeah, we did do uh, quite a bit of that. I mean, we were going back and forth. So Luckily, you know, the the FAO Schwartz exterior set and the ice rink were actually close by. And, uh, you know, the rock of the tree and all that, it was all kind of kind of in generally the same space. So and Tim, we to confirm you rebuilt all of this in Atlanta, right? Because you had said before you guys didn't shoot in New York. So no, no, no. This is all built at that same space as at at the rooftop was shot. None of the main unit or the 
of the second unit was shot of this sequence was shot in New York. It was all shot in Atlanta on an open air blue screen stage. Yep, exactly. At yeah. night. <laughs> At night in the cold. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that that all we kind of tag team that thing. We were going bad. Sometimes we'd start it after move over to the ice rink and back. And I can I can't remember the reason. I think it was a lot of it was actor availability and things like that lighting too we had moving the lights yeah we had a finite number of lifts with with lights on them and some you know we'd have to repurpose them for the rooftop set they would take a couple hours to move and restructure the thing so if we wanted to go back and forth between two big sets we really had to kind of plan on doing that in advance we couldn't pivot in the moment there was a lot going on. Uh, Eric Spielberg and Dan Cornwall designed the, especially the the ice rink had a lot of real reference in terms of color because they were using some plates that were shot in New York um, and wanted to be true to kind of the, like the real ice rink there. So they had a lighting scheme and a color scheme that was developed by the, by the two of them, by Eric and Dan Cornwall. And then we inherited that. We actually were lucky to get Dan Cornwall in a number the gaffer uh, from main unit on a number of occasions because his dimmer board operator and he knew the cues. There were so many cues that it, it just didn't make sense for us to try to relearn that stuff from a lighting perspective. So um, there was lighting for us to do, but the actual cues were delivered by that team, the main unit dimmer board team and, and Dan Cornwall. It was really helpful. It was actually learned. I learned a lot from Dan. He's a mad scientist of, of lighting and using new technologies and, and designing uh, systems that work to tell stories. Like that's, that's an aside, but it's a really cool, like he's got a great mind for the new technology. Now talk to me about some of the specific things uh, pulling it off. I noticed in rewatching the sequence, for example, there's all these trick arrows. I'm guessing there's visual effects involved in what happens, but there are also people doing very practical things, whether it's going up in the air or falling down on the ice. It's So second unit, first unit, visual effects. Talk to me more about some of these specific shots, like how they come together. A lot of it was wire work, having, you know, stunt people in a harness attached to wire being pulled or whether it's a hand pull where they're, you know, just being pulled by another person off camera. A lot of things like that. I don't remember all the exact specifics of each beat there um or someone walking a tiny little van or truck through space as it shrinks and lands on the ice oh <laughs> uh, yeah that one that was fun <laughs> exactly greg Steele was um the main unit visual effects supervisor was present for all of our work there because it was so visual effects intensive yeah specialty arrows the explosions again lighting cues that service interactive lighting for for those gags is Super important for VFX and melding everything. Interactive lighting is very difficult to build, especially on people's faces and uh, pre-existing uh, sets that are built. Um, it's much better to do that practically. So yeah, the, the visual effects team was highly involved in, in sculpting that fight. And you said night and cold. Is this set built? I'm familiar with OFS. So you're not inside the large building. You're actually exterior sets taking advantage of it being night or they just made you shoot at night because no we were at exterior i don't know if you there's a what they call big blue which is again that 70 foot tall stack of containers that has a blue screen on it that's immense but it's in it's got a, a an enormous space so you're able to shoot exterior stuff and then all the plate shots they can add in on the blue screen from new york so it, it needed to be bigger than something. And I don't think we had, I believe something else was shooting there too. I don't even know if the inside space was even available at the time. Black Panther was prepping and building some stuff on the interior. So uh, actually you couldn't have built the ice rink on a, at no. a stage in Atlanta. They don't have a big enough stage. Exactly. And the FAO Schwartz and the connectivity of those sets and how they were designed and how the art department placed them in space uh, worked great for the workflow couldn't have been done on stage. So, you know, unfortunately we have to work at night, but you know, that's just our desk. That's our destiny. <laughs> I know. <It> has been. <laughs> and actually on that show, I remember we were going back and forth a lot too. And we were going shoot days to nights, to days to nights. And that's always difficult. <laughs> so at the start, we talked about the scope of work on second unit and that often 
you end up seeing the main cast as well. Was that true for Hawkeye? Uh, yes. Yeah, we did. We had, um, I think we had every main actor except Haley. I don't believe we had her, um, at least not that I remember. Um, we had Jeremy um, one night. We've had uh, Alakwa, uh, who plays uh, Maya Lopez, a.k.a. Echo, several times. And that was actually one of one of the more interesting experiences of the show, because, as you know, she is, she is deaf. I've never uh, had to experience that process of, you know, she has uh, ESL interpreters with her um, on set. So, you know, the process of, of relaying all the information to her and, you know, it's kind of something that's interesting. And she was wonderful. Her team was wonderful. Um, it was actually very refreshing in a lot of ways just to have that experience. We did have some pretty big scenes with her in the show. She was with us uh, for the KB Toy Store uh, stuff we did early on. And then at the end when we did, uh, you know, the final, we always call it the final battle because, you know, <laughs> it always comes to a, to a final uh, struggle at the end. And that when we were doing the um, Times Square stuff, she was with us a lot those days. Um, so, yeah, we definitely had that on, on this and uh, what was the scene? So we shot a lot of the scene of the final scene with her and Fra, where he dies with the Lachlan Fra, um, who Fra plays Kazi. That was that was actually quite interesting because that was a pretty dramatic scene, kind of sets up her journey as Echo. And so that was kind of an interesting thing that, that kind of ended up, wasn't planned, but it ended up on our plate as, you know, the end of the schedule grew closer and deadlines had to be met. We had to pick up a lot of a lot of uh, of the weight, which was, um, you know, kind of a again very interesting and experience to work with her. You know, work on a very performance driven scene, and I know Paul was very excited about it. So, you know, it was one of those little things that you don't expect, and then you know, as a second unit, you end up some say throw something at you, and you're like, all right, here we go. <laughs> Just a matter of getting it done. Yeah, exactly. It speaks to the diversity in skill sets uh, as a as a unit that you have to have to be able to go from stunts to VFX to inserts to main actor photography. You have to be ready for all of it and you have to be ready to do it when it's not pre-planned. And that's yeah. that's part of the challenge and part of the excitement of doing the, the second unit work is the skill sets more varied, definitely. So the show's been well-received. And so, Tim, I'm imagining from what you said earlier, that's your reward that things did run well and, and made it onto the screen. Darren, when you watch the show, what do you think? Do you see the return on your work? Do you see all the effort of Second Unit? I see the effort when I don't notice the change from main unit photography to second. The goal for me is for it to seem like it's all happening contiguously, obviously, in the action. And if I pick apart my work, it's because it doesn't fit. I watch it with the eye of, did I do my job and make it fit seamlessly into the main unit photography? I know that uh, filming on Hawkeye wrap, I guess, mid-year, maybe April, May, you talked about some reshoots in 2021. You guys teased at the beginning, where did you guys move on after Hawkeye? We had about a month off and then we went to Budapest and we were there. No, we didn't. Months. Remember, we were... We kind of rolled straight over. Well, you had you had more time. I, no, I had a month off. Yeah, I, I basically left the day after Hawkeye. I was on a plane to, to Budapest for Moon Knight, which is uh, coming up uh, hopefully in March. I, I'd love to be able to talk more about that once that's uh, fully released. But yeah, we got to, we pretty much jumped right in. We, we again, we knew we were doing that while we were um, finishing Hawkeye. Well, I know better than to press you on the details of the show, this being Marvel and all, but I do hope you guys will come back once that is released and uh, let us know what it's like behind the scenes. It's been too long, guys. Stay in touch. We'll talk soon. Yeah, absolutely. Take care. Yeah, thank you, Skid. Award season is upon us, and that means some schedule updates. Next week, Below the Line will release two episodes, Monday and Thursday, where I'll be joined by a panel of fellow ADs to discuss the Directors Guild film nominees. That'll lead us directly into our Oscar coverage the week after that. If you're new to the podcast and curious about what's coming before, it's easy to peruse past episodes at the website belowthelineoneword.biz. That's B-I-Z. All episodes of the podcast are also on IMDb, so you can cross-reference the film credits of my guests. 
Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And rate us if you like what you hear. If you've got questions or comments, you can send email to skid, S-K-I-D, at blowtheline.biz. If you're on Facebook, you can find photos and other behind-the-scenes materials at Podcast Below the Line. And finally, you can follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram. It's at Pod Below the Line. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music and John Juan for our logo. The logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. Loyal listeners, you are much appreciated. If you're enjoying the podcast, tell your friends. We'll be back again next week. That's for you, Darren. We oh, where do we move no, on to? Oh, yeah, you want you're trying that's a trap. That's a that's a trap. Now, I don't the, think it now again, it's you guys are already on INDB for Moon Knight. I don't think yeah, mentioning yeah. Moon Knight is gonna get you in trouble. If no, you guys no, think it I'm is, sure. we can go a different direction on this. I'm not no, 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 I'm trying to bait no, you. I'm, I was no. more screwed, Darren. I'm I'm happy to take <laughs>